to yourself in space, contributing to a new chapter of human exploration as a NASA astronaut. NASA is not just looking for the required skills to buy. It's looking for more than that. The spark, your passion, and your belief that the sky is not the limit. What's your dream? Ready to make history? The universe is calling. therapy interview friday something weird happened at the beginning of the show but that was an ad for nasa any of you want to be an astronaut i want to astronaut be an astronaut let me tell you if you want to go up there and mine the the moon for them or maybe be a, one of those uh people that lives on mars welcome welcome to it welcome to it I'm not going, I'll tell you that. But anyway, that was very, very inspiring advertisement, sort of like on Survivor when they ask you to be on Survivor. I'm not, I'm not getting strapped to a bomb, no way. Hey, it might get dark, right? It might get dark. April 19th, Ginny Sykes, my guest today, is gonna to be doing stand-up at this thing called The Crow, which is a really interesting venue out there in Santa Monica, California. If anybody wants to go check that out, there's a link in the show notes. This is the promotion for that. Let's get into the show. This is called Joel Marshall's Lunch Therapy, and I'm your host, go figure, Joel Marshall. Hi, everybody. These are some beautiful peacocks we had on the show on Tuesday. Tuesday's show, so that you know, is a variety show where we have contests. We have guest comedians come on and co-host, and it's just a blast. So I invite anybody to come on Tuesday at noon. Today is Interview Friday, where we interview fascinating people. And today, it's Ginny Sykes, peacock lover, uh, uh, unicorn hater or unicorn denier. Holy Ginyell. Great to see you here. Mama J, hoity, hoity, yay, Ginny, the most adventurous woman I know. It's so true. We're gonna find out that she's like one of the bravest, weirdest folks that you will ever come across. Uh, this, is a pe this peacock might be a pea hen. Apparently the pea hens are um, marginalized because the peacocks are really the males. Isn't that interesting? interesting thing isn't it why don't we hear about the peahens i don't know the world is weird patriarchal society i guess this is a unicorn just to prove to jenny that there are unicorns out there and uh so that, you know i mean there it is there it is let's see if we can see it again i want to say thank you to all the patreons these are the patreons people that support the show so grateful for them Rex Sykes is here, the brother of Jenny Sykes, genius uh, philosopher out there, wild, weird peacock man as well. It's a fun song. Psyched! We were all psyched. It's a fun song. I think this is a religious song. 
Oh, there's the unicorn again. I don't know. I'm just having fun. Let's get into this thing. Let's do some breathing. So glad to have everybody here today. We've got some cats because cats are the rulers of the internet. Some cats and some clowns. Clowns are big these days. And we're gonna breathe while watching clowns, cats, and acrobats in through the nose, out through the toes. Hold it. Let it go. Down the back of your spine. Hoy Rex, hoy Howie, hoy Ginny from Camila Lopez. Look at that guy, juggle man. In through the nose, out through the toes. Hold it. Let him go. That's like a gang of circus performers there. Cat clowns, yep. You can do this while you're breathing. In through the nose, out through the toes. Let it go. You can do this if you want. It feels good, actually, surprisingly. Holy Pam Palmieri. Pam was on the show on Tuesday. Whoa, there's some tough clowns there. Um, we had a really fun time. Check out that show. Pam Palmieri, comedian, real estate agent, used to be my boss years ago, strangely enough. Hey, that helps my arms. All right. Yeah, if you have frozen shoulder out there, it's a good way to relieve it. I'm not a doctor, just saying. Probably shouldn't do that though. Hey, look at that, an exotic bird. We're gonna talk about that later. Now for a little music. In this show, we do uh, therapeutic things before we get into the interview, just to get everybody relaxed. Ginny is in the green room with Boney. They're all, you know, they're moving their arms. They're listening to hand pans. So great to have everybody here today. Really excited to talk to Ginny. Let's listen to this music for a little while. From Akira Sunrise. Japan, one of my favorite hand pan players. say while the show's going on please chat please recommend questions we're going to ask Ginny what her biggest regret is of 2024 thanks to Howard Howard Ronan darling of comedy is here in the chat room we got some real celebrities in the chat room today this guy is so good No pictures. That's the regret. Yeah. Holy Jeff Lohman from Thailand. Just got back from Belgium where he saw our friend Sven de Kock. That was cool. Oh, those are the water drums that he has. Those are like big balls in water. There's a joke there somewhere all right thank you Aki Ra Sunrise Super Jeff back from Belgium shake it out all right thank you 
so much, Akira Sunrise. Go to his uh, YouTube channel, subscribe. <clears throat> delightful, delightful musician. Awesome meeting with Sven. I'm glad, so glad. Wanted to have him on the show, old Sven from Belgium. Maybe someday. Here we go. Now it's time. Now it is time for the interview. We have now relaxed. We're now ready. There's, we're clearing our throats. Um, I have to do that all the time. Uh, Ginny Sykes. Who is Ginny Sykes? Ginny Sykes is an LA-based comedian and award-winning journalist. She has been a friend of mine for many, 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 many years. She has a fascinating dual career. She's not only graced the comedy stages like the Improv and the Comedy Store and the Gotham Comedy Club in New York, but she's also de delved into the darker side of life. Her interviews with serial murderers, drug mules, gang members reveal her fearless pursuit of the truth. She's raised in Wisconsin. Jenny's journey led her to New York where she earned her master's degree in journalism from Columbia. And then she started interviewing people like Nicolas Cage, Harrison Ford, coal miners, astrophysicists, and even sign language using chimps. Her work appeared in the Washington Post. A lot of you probably don't know this about her. Glamour, Vanity Fair, Essence, Travel and Leisure, the New York Times, respected journalist. Beyond print, she, started, she worked in television, A&E, PBS, VH1. She produced episodes of the acclaimed documentary series, True Life, and worked on Rock the Vote, the 2000 election special. And then she crossed paths with Kamala Lopez, who saw her book, Ginny's book, Eight Ball Chicks, um, which is a staple in college courses worldwide. It's a book about street gangs, girls in street gangs. And I mean, amazing book. I highly recommend it. I'm gonna have to talk to her about that. Um, so she met Kamala, they started corresponding. We were working on this film, Equal Means Equal, exploring the Equal Rights Amendment and women's rights in America, and that led to the ratification of our latest amendment to the Constitution, known as the ERA. Still has to be published. Write your congressperson, call Joe Biden, let him know we gotta publish that thing. In 2018, Jenny shifted, just in a rapid pivot, from being a serious journalist to being a ridiculous, clownish, performing stand-up on the stage. And she has had the privilege of sharing the spotlight with Pete Holmes, Tom Arnold, Felicia Michaels, Rick Overton, and Daryl Hammond, just off the top of my head. And drawing from her offbeat life, she explores missteps, unicorns, unicorns, and her unique perspective as a pessimistic Pollyanna. Oh my God, someone's watching us now. Let's get into this thing called Interview Friday. Yeah. I just got my eyebrows done. And I went in asking, like, I was like, uh, can you make me look like Brooke Shields? And they were like, ma'am. We are expert at eyebrows. We don't do eyes, nose, chin, face, and whatever this is. But we can make you look like another celebrity. I was like, cool. It was Red Angry Bird. People keep telling me to smile. I am. Great to have you here. Ginny Sykes, welcome to Lunch Therapy. Well, I'm so glad to be here. You know, I love you and all the hummingbirds. Oh, yeah, yeah. We love the hummingbirds. Yes, Mama Jane. That, that intro is like even, like, what is my regret for 2024? Yeah. That my resume sounds better than my actual life. <laughs> Come on now. 
Come on. Your life is amazing. You have led an incredible, incredible life. I well, was it, it comes with being a journalist. Comes with being a journalist? Yeah. Really? Was that something that you yeah, always wanted to do when you were like a kid? Yeah. 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 Like in my fifth grade diary, I wrote, um, I live was living in Wisconsin and it said, I'm gonna go to school in the South. I mean, why there? And then I'm gonna move to New York or LA and write about rock music. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I went to college in Missouri. Yeah. And I moved to LA after college and I uh, worked for Tiger Beat. Then I moved to New York. So I did everything in that diary. <laughs> but so I wasn't cool. planning it like that. It just it was just, like almost famous, sort of. Sort of like this movie. Oh, I actually, I actually read Cameron Crowe as a kid. I, I was you? a big fan of his. He uh, wrote so for uh, Cream Magazine. Yeah. Did you? So. You're a very, one of the, in, this is weird, but one of the most interesting things about you is how interested you are in the world and people. You're just like a naturally interested person. And I don't know, does that come out of being a journalist or were you always like that? And that's why you became a journalist. You know, I, I think it's a, you know, like chicken or the egg thing. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was like that. Like my dad was always asking people, he came to visit me in New York and he was like asking, um, a cop like what was happening on the streets and we went into the grocery store and he asked this woman how you she had a, a what what is that plant a yucca, yucca? so when, yeah. it, he was asking her how to cook it then we walked by a guy painting his house he's like oh you know is that a historic house then we go past um the pratt school of design and he's yelling at these kids sitting there going do you guys know the boiling point of brass <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just offhand. Sure. I know that. So, I mean, th that runs in my family. And I think that the reason I became a journalist is it's obviously I have severe ADHD, but that wasn't diagnosed. Mm. But um, I, I get very, uh, I'm very chaotic in my, in my, you know, what interests me. But once I get interested, I take a deep dive. Oh, and then yeah. I'm, I'm done. You know, like once I get everything I want, on to the next. Claster fan says, wow, you're a writer at Tiger Beat. Jeff Lohman says, Tiger Beat, what a flashback. Now here's a oh, question. Oh, oh. What was it like writing and interviewing the creatives at all? Hmm. That's what Claster uh, says. You mean like actors? Like right, interviewing yeah. actors? Um, I was the entertainment, well, I was the entertainment editor at um, Mademoiselle. Also, as a kid, when I was writing for the school newspaper, I would interview any band that was close by or came, really? like, so I reviewed Patti Smith. Oh my um, God. I, I couldn't get interviews with them. I would review their, their shows. So I reviewed Patti Smith, Lou Reed, David Bowie. And then, um, I interviewed sticks, uh, sticks. This was while you were in high school. Yeah. They took your I, interviews that like, you're just like, what'd you do? Like, go to the concert and then go and backstage or something? Or what did you yeah. do? And, yeah. you know, because I was young, you know, they let me in, but I would write to the promoters. I would, you know, I lived in um, the middle of the state. And sometimes I would tell my mom I was sleeping at over at someone's house. Mm -hmm. And my friend would do the same. And we'd drive down to Milwaukee and see concerts. Uh, wow. Yeah. And is that how uh, you got your job at Tiger Beat? Were you like, here's my writing samples. I interviewed Sticks, and they were like, Sticks, come on, come on in. Well, I, I went to college for journalism and I interviewed yeah. like Studs Terkel, um, a lot of different people. Studs Terkel, Pat wow. Interviewed the interviewer. Patricia, Patricia O'Neill, is that her name? Mm -hmm. uh, the actress? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I moved to um, LA. My brother was living there and I wanted to get into the music business. I wanted yeah. to write about it. And um, Actually, my first uh, job was at Teen, and I got fired because I dyed my hair purple. You and, what? Uh, you got fired for that? Wow! Now well, you're making a lawsuit, probably. Well, yeah, and that I I, I think I uh, they just didn't like me. I mean, yeah. I probably was. I don't know. Maybe I was obnoxious. <laughs> but maybe. anyway, my brother knew. Um, the editors over at Tiger Beat. I actually worked for the soap opera magazine there and they put out a soap opera magazine right on, which was a magazine for um, black uh, uh, oh, idols, yeah. uh, Tiger Beat. 
John Stamos used to hang around the office before he was famous. And this editor had a crush on him. And she um, she was all, she actually helped make him famous. But she also married the Night Stalker. I'm sure I've told this story oh before. Oh, my God. Yeah, I've heard you tell that story. That's so. Wait, she married the Night Stalker and she survived the whole thing. Like he was like. Yeah, well, he was in prison, so he couldn't get her. But oh, he, um, she's one of those people that marries the, the people in prison. Hey, um, why was John Stamos allowed to hang out? You weren't allowed to die. Oh, this was a different place. But you, John Stamos was just hanging out there. This is, well, a, this is a way to become famous. You hang out at Tiger Beat and Tiger all of a sudden Beat you're was, John Stamos. This, this company was so, it was the best job I ever had. And I'm still in touch with most of the people that work there. Yeah. I mean, you'd be there and like uh, Prince would come in and not talk to you because he was very shy or um, really? they would take the pictures of the stars in the building. So anyone that you saw a picture of had come in and, um, so we you saw had... Prince. Prince came up and he like stood next well, to the desk, and you were to like, them. "What are you doing? How are you doing, Prince?" And he just like didn't talk. Well, yeah. he was actually he was uh, friends with the editor of Write On, who was also very shy. And yeah. they were down at the Tiger Restaurant. They actually had a, a restaurant in the building named Tiger Restaurant. Really? And she and Prince were talking to each other, and they were both looking at each other. And she said, without looking at me, she was like, "Jenny, this is Prince." And then Prince is hi, Jenny. <laughs> they didn't look at you. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Did you ever meet Leif Garrett? He was up there. He was definitely up there. And his sister, he had a sister named, Leif has a sister named Dawn. And I don't remember if you remember the show, My Three Sons mm -hmm. um, sure. with Fred McMurray. They yeah. had a little girl. They had a little girl named Dottie. And that was Leaf Garrett's sister, so she no used to way. be up there too. Can you and, sing the theme song to uh, to uh, My Three Sons? Um, my brother can. Because I'm only he's getting I'm only getting a family affair when I think of that. But now I've ruined it. Jeff Jeff now Loman that says that I can't. Yeah, now forget it, forget it. Jeff Loman says, "What was the worst journalist gig that you ever had?" I can't think of a specific, but what would make it bad is if yeah. um, the thing about with editors, like you didn't have much control over your work. So yeah. you, you could spend um, a long time researching something and then it would be edited in such a way for space that it didn't make yeah. sense. And that oh, was frustrating. That and, frustrating. Uh, you know, when I worked for MTV, I went down to West Virginia to do a story on Oxycontin and this was in 2000. And I got in a coal mine. I got all this, you know, great footage that they didn't use because they thought it looked too 60 minutes. And I was no like, oh. way, no way. <laughs> you risk your life going into the coal mine. And what do you get for it? Nothing. Working in a coal mine. Working in a coal mine. And my friend signed me up on this site called Never Too Late. Oh my it's for singles in hospice. <laughs> so this elderly gentleman gifted me with my first penis portrait. I think. <laughs> I was like, is that a melted candle? <laughs> No, I think somebody poured salt on a slug. Oh. So after this, after this show, we have a date. <laughs> if you are wondering why I'm dressed like a ninth grade whore. Oh, oh yay! Yay for the whores! Whores in the whores! Ninth grade whores! <laughs> Did uh, <laughs> All right, so moving on. So you you then were working in television too, right? Yeah. How, how do you yeah. segue from, was this just being a journalist? Like people were like, oh, or did you say, I want to work in television? Like, is this something no, you wanted to do? Um, I, was, I was working as an editor at Mademoiselle and um, I got a call and they were looking for a 
host, but they wanted somebody who had magazine experience. Mm -hmm. And this is funny how times have changed. I went to audition and I found out later that the guy said he liked me, but I was too exotic. Too exotic. <laughs> and, and, you know, my hair is naturally dark and I look, yeah. looked very Asian. <laughs> I mean, exotic. I was exotic. Like, Some of the stuff that happened, you know, in the past is really amazing. Like exotic. Um, and now I'm not exotic enough. Yeah. <laughs> I've saw, I often think that about you, Jenny. Like, you know, she's great, but I wish she was more exotic. Like maybe if you got an exotic bird. Maybe. I think I have that here, but I don't know where it is. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Let's do it. Let's do it. I woke up this morning and I thought, uh, oh my God, I, it's too late. I will never have a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Parrots are amazing. They converse. That's a big step up from my ex. <laughs> Yeah, you don't look that impressed by a bird that can talk. <laughs> I'd like to see you lay an egg. <laughs> but bird, uh, parrots can also live 60 years, so its odds are 100% it will outlast this. <laughs> I have to face facts. I've aged out of exotic birds. Oh. <laughs> oh, Polly want a casket. <laughs> Oh my God, that was so good. I love that. What? Where was that, that we were looking up at you like you were on a pedestal somewhere? It was at Dynasty Typewriter. And um, it was, it, they had a show and then they just drew names from the audience and then you yeah. got to come up for three minutes. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Exotic isn't a bad look in my book. Is it not a compliment? You would think it would be a compliment, but I think what well, they were saying is you're, you look like you're from another country or something is what they were saying. That was their euphemism. It's so the, funny because, you know, racism. It's, it's so funny because it would be a plus, you know, yeah, today. You would think. You would think. Um, all right. So um, I wanted to ask you about this. Eight Ball Chicks. So this book is unbelievable. It's sort of like our friend Tommy Sowards. You know Tommy Sowards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also yeah. made that movie about slipping, about with the bloods and the crypts. You, t both of you, are fearless. I don't understand. You'd think that if you went to go interview um, gang members, they'd be like, I'm not talking about that. But you get like really, really interesting stories, some of them horrific, um, in this book. How did you, how did this happen? Well, um, <clears throat> I was writing um, uh, and I wrote a piece, uh, I was working at MTV and I met this girl who said that there were um, girl gangs in her high school. This was in New York. Mm -hmm. And at that time, because these goes in cycles, New York didn't have, you know, these were like posse. I, I focused on teenagers. So these were like posses, like mm -hmm. they could exist and then break up and then reform. Yeah. And so I wrote a piece on uh, these girls. And when I went to go meet them, what really struck me was like one girl had razor blade uh, scars from a fight she got into oh, because yeah. it, it would stick razor blades in their mouth. They put and them in their them mouth. I asked them how they did that. And they're, it's like when you ask somebody how you learn to do a cherry, like tie the cherry stem. Yeah. It never, the answer never makes me know how. Like they would just say, oh, you just keep sticking it in until yeah. <laughs> you get it. Yeah, but, she um, said she put it in her mouth and the one girl put it in her mouth and it started cutting up her mouth. But then she got used to it after a few, after a lot of bloody mouth experiences. Right. <laughs> it got used to it somehow. You know, in football, but, we used to put on the helmet and we'd smash into each other and you'd get like a headache at the beginning of the yeah. season. And then after a while, it didn't do anything. <laughs> that explains so, a lot, my friend. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> But so, yeah, I mean, and also I've seen people that like twirl like a razor blade in their mouth, like, you know, they start to become really good at it. But um, yeah, these stories were unbelievable. Some one, you know, you said one about a woman who used to keep her husband's member in the uh, glove compartment. No, I didn't know that was somebody that was a woman I spoke to on the phone and she had been arrested in Wisconsin with yeah. uh, her lover and they were accused of 
dismembering her other lover. And I called her in prison. She was saying that she wasn't guilty, that the guy made her do it. But <laughs> just was the, it was so weird to talk to someone because she sounded just like any woman in Wisconsin. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, there was this big stain. And <laughs> you know, like, can't get the stain out from where yeah. I killed my husband. They, that's the thing is they people seem to talk to you very frankly or like you were in a ca rental car and they were going to shoot up the rental car and and you were like you're not shooting up my rental i don't know where you get this like bravery but you're like you're not shooting up my rental car and they were like well we won't shoot the driver's seat or whatever uh, well but you know it's it's well it i don't know if it's bravery but yeah as a journalist i have a, it's like a persona i have um a, a fearlessness that i don't have as me Mm -hmm. Like if I were going in there as Jenny Sykes, just going, Hey, you want to hang out? I would not have had that, but because I had a job to do and I had a book deadline. So I was like, Holy shit, I got to do this. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, but the other thing that said, yeah, I'm also myself when I meet these people and you know, I'm, don't come across as particularly threatening. I mean, I'm goofy. And I remember like these girls would drive with me and they'd be like, God, I'd rather be in a drive-by shooting than driving the back of your car because you're <laughs> such a terrible driver. Um, and, yeah. and so I think that had to do with it. And also the people who talk to you, this is one thing, like most of the people I spoke to were very articulate and that's a process of me choosing that person because they can tell me the information and them choosing me. There was one girl and, I, and, and she wasn't, um, it wasn't as though she was stupid. She just was, she wasn't used to talking to adults and stuff. And she would have her friend translate like what she was saying to me. So, um, you know, I'm sure that there's a process of selection, you know, and. and why someone talks to me and why someone doesn't. That's really interesting. I think partially too, because you're really genuinely interested. Like when you come up to somebody and you ask them a question or when you ask me a question, I feel like you're genuinely interested in it. So if I answer the question, you're gonna actually like listen to the answer and like you really wanna know and you're not trying to play somebody. You know what I mean? Like, the you know- The flip you, side of that yeah. is asking too many questions. I mean, I've had oh, yeah. people, like I think it's showing interest and it yeah. is for me, but some people, I mean, I've had people say, well, just, you know, quit, quit asking. And I don't like being asked questions. You I mean, not like this, but like, yeah. I, I remember um, I had a friend uh, introduce me to her friend who was a shrink and she kept asking me, all, it wasn't art. It wasn't anybody, you know? Yeah. And um, so she kept asking me all these questions. I was like, God, shut up. And then I thought, oh, that's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. All right. Here we go. We're moving on. Now we're getting into the really deep stuff. I thought getting older would take longer. <laughs> it is tough aging as a woman, as a white woman, because we don't die. We just fade away. <laughs> wow. Yeah, apparently I'm invisible. Men cut in front of me in line. Sales clerks act like I don't exist. One thing's gotten better. Shoplifting. <laughs> I'm a ghost. <laughs> but I've only, I only have ever taken what I truly needed. Plan B and milk does. Recently, I really needed a Tesla. <laughs> so I got in and just drove off the lot. The sales guy was like, there's nobody, holy crap, they really do drive themselves. <laughs> I'm coming out as translucent. All right, yeah, so we, that's hilarious. I mean, it's, it's, Sad yet hilarious at the same time. Uh, did you, when you came out here, did you come out here because we were working on Equal Means Equal? Is that what made, yeah. brought you to Los Angeles again? Yeah. yeah, I, God, you guys have been so instrumental in my life. So, Cam, I met Cam when she called me in New York because she wanted to see if she, she could do a script uh, based on my book. And then, uh, so I decided to move out there. And then she, um, then she got 
into the ERA thing. And then I did that with her. Yeah. But um, I mean, the thing that is so weird is I had no interest in comedy, never thought about it. And I had worked in, you know, with com comedic writers. I, wrote, yeah. I worked on Dennis Leary's first show, but no interest in performing. I have no performance background. And on a fluke, I took a storytelling class. You came to see it and then said, oh, you should do stand up. I was like, no, I shouldn't. I have no interest. But you, <laughs> but you and Kamala were both taking the class. And I only took it because I thought it was nice of you to invite me. And you were my, you know, my friends in L.A. who yeah. I come out. To. Yeah. And it's just so weird because it would not have happened any other way. So I That's owe a, everything to you, Joel. Or, do, I, or, or maybe I owe my unsuccessful comedy career to <laughs> right, you. Exactly. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. No, I think it's great. I, I, you know what's so great about you too is you seem. I mean, any guests that I have on the show, you seem to know them. Like you're really, you're really like in the comedy world, like the comedy uh, community here, and uh, that's really, like it's a, it's kind of a great community that we have here in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, well, it really it saved my life because I met them during COVID because I did a lot of Zoom comedy and a lot of comics, you know, pro comics didn't do it because it felt just too weird. Yeah. But through Zoom, then when we met each other in person, um, we it was like a high school reunion where you didn't go to school with each other. But yeah. I had all these friends I didn't really know. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, one thing I do know about the 80s is that comedians were, I think, I don't know on the very highest levels, but I'm just talking what I heard in the 80s mm -hmm. was that comics are really hard on each other, yeah. you know, yeah. they roast yeah. each other. And, you know, there were, weren't that many female comics. And yeah. at this moment in time, it's so different. You know, there's a it lot is, of female. Comics. Yeah. And the fact that I'm, you know, over 60 and I'm performing, I mean, will I ever become famous? I would doubt it. But I mean, I get to perform. And I don't think that would have happened at another time. And you took with a lot of the masters of comedy, you know, teaching, like, you know, Stephen Rosenfield and uh, Je Jerry Corley and, and uh, Greg Dean and Gayla Johnson. Bobby Oliver. Bobby Lisa Oliver. Sunset, yeah. Um, Barry Katz. Barry Katz, yeah. Uh, Barry Neal. <laughs> I took a lot. <laughs> uh, Cynthia Levin. Yep. Yeah. She was my first. Yeah, she's so, my first. She's your first. Well, she's a good first person too. To you know, like she was the first person I met in comedy that like I took took classes from, and I think she's so great because she just really gets you to be honest, and really gets you to like really explore yourself on a deeper level than you might otherwise do, and and all the stuff that it's uncomfortable really in the beginning, didn't you think? Also, though, she's a gentle, yeah, gentle teacher. Yeah, you feel like she has your your back or has you is holding you a little bit. Yeah, she's she's amazing. She is really an incredible teacher. And then other so what are some of your favorite teachers and what did you get out of that? Well, I love Stephen Rosenfeld, who we, mm -hmm. you you and Jay, um, Mama Jay took. We all took from him. Yeah. Um, oh God, they all offer something. Um, I uh, they're all good. But, they are. Uh, they are all good, but like it, they come at it from different angles a lot of times, right? You know what was interesting about Greg Dean is mm -hmm. if I had taken Greg Dean um, initially, yeah, I don't. I would have been. It would. It was like because his first. He has two. You know, you do the first level, then the second. His first level was like math to me. Yeah, because he's breaking down joke. How you the you know the structure of a joke, and nobody else had done that to me. It was more. For me, it was more um, innate, you know, like you would kind of listen to other people and kind of get it. Um, so if I had taken it first, I would have been, oh, man, this is too complex. But having taken like Bobby Oliver and other people, when I came to Greg Dean, I was like, oh, this is how you tell a show. Yeah, so it's like it you're like, you get time. to that point. I was the same way. I got to him and I was like, oh, I see. Like, so you kind of have a feel for it when you're working with somebody that's really just getting you to talk. Right. And you, you kind of and then you re realize in the audience when they laugh, but you're not exactly sure why <laughs> a lot of times. Right. 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 <laughs> and, and sometimes I would be like I would be doing an open mic like with Jimmy Shin, you know, yeah. or taking yeah. a bus with Jimmy Shin. And somebody would go, but you have no punchline. And <laughs> right. I'm going, 
<laughs> but I thought I had a punchline. <laughs> she almost like, was- tell me what a punchline is again. <laughs> or a setup or, you know, all these, all this terminology that, I, and then there's also like, if you talk to Jerry Corley, there's like 13 different varieties of jokes that you can do. And, uh, it becomes, you know, it starts to open up, but it's, uh, but usually the hardest thing that people, I find the the hardest thing to teach with people is for them to speak from their center and find their voice. And now, also, are you talking about literally like the body like speaking from the center and projecting or do you no? Or... i mean actually see, speaking from the core of who you are that makes you unique you know got it because yeah. a lot of times people get up on stage and they have a rehearsed uh, thing and it maybe it, maybe it's really well written it's got uh, punch lines and it's got setups and it's got rule of three and it's got callbacks and all the stuff that's all the formula for good comedy but that does they don't seem like they're talking they don't seem like they're just talking you know what I mean? Well, I really relate to that because I feel that's that's what I have to work with a lot because I don't come from a performance background. And mm-hmm. you as an actor kind of know how to get into the emotion of what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And especially when you're saying the same thing over and over to find yeah. that emotion each time. Yeah. So I'm that's a constant um, challenge for me that I, you know, I'm having to work with because um, like in the clips you showed, I was very comfortable because the audience was very enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. But but it's um and I'm getting you know better. But I it is hard for me to, um, yeah to to show the emotion or to feel it at the moment. Do you ever? Sometimes I get overly emotional about things like and it becomes like a rant. You know what I mean? Like, no, you know, but that's good. Yeah, I, I think it's sometimes good. I don't know whether it's off putting or not. I don't know. How do you do you have you have you experimented with different kinds of um, approaches with your, your emotional yeah. engagement? Yeah, I have, um, you know, like crowd work, you know, crowd work when you're engaging the crowd that I find like that is really hard to practice because you have to give up your stage time yeah. in order to do it. Yeah. I mean, the only way you learn it is by doing it live. And there are tricks to it. And I'm taking a couple crowd work classes, but I just don't want to spend the time going, hey, what do you do for a living? And risk like them saying something I have no comeback for, you know? <laughs> right. And I just go, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of doing for that. I, we had yeah. Shang, Shang on here, who's been oh, uh, comedian for so long. And he's so good with the crowd, but he's he's got his material but he's like able to just go off and come back. And uh, that's just an amazing, but that's, I guess it's just from a lot of stage time, a lot of being up there, you know? You know, I, the, my biggest, you know, challenge is, you know, I have chronic fatigue. And so if I could go to a, do a mic every day, I would, and I have the time to do it. I just don't have the energy, but there are so many people I know who do. And uh, Barry Katz just had a clip up today about Jeff Foxworthy did, 500 shows a year for five years. Wow. That's more days than there are. Yeah. That's, more, you know, I mean, that's what I think you got to do, you know? Yeah. You always hear about that where people are like Steve Martin, when he first started out, he was doing, you know, he'd go from one club to the next to the next, just doing his thing over and over again. That's the thing too. Sometimes you feel like you have to like do the same jokes over and over again. And I, I liken it to like, you know, some of your favorite musicians, they only have a few songs that you like, <laughs> and they, uh, but they have their whole living is doing that. And they have to like every time find, you know, even like Paul Simon talks about how he, the songs evolve over time. Where, and I find that too with comedy too. Some of the jokes that are kind of your core jokes, they find new life in other situations. Oh, you know? oh absolutely. Absolutely. And what you want to emphasize in the, in the um, where you place them in the act, you know. Yeah. Jeff Loman says, I subjugate my students to my comedy. Technically, this probably constitutes child abuse. Being a teacher, uh, I, might be a good Jeff Loman is one of the funniest people hilarious. I know. Yeah, so I, like I suspect you're either, you're, if, <laughs> either your children are dumb if they don't like your jokes or, <laughs> or you're not subjecting them to child abuse. <laughs> and also, like when you're giving a serious lecture, something that Camel and I were talking about, because she talks about, you know, equal rights amendment and women is that to inject comedy in that is oh, such yeah. a great tool. And I think it's probably true for teachers. And that's why a lot of teachers um, start to become comedians like Jeff Lohman, 
who's now um, starting to do stand-up comedy in um, fields with um, water buffalo. Check that out on Lunch Therapy. <laughs> but if the water buffalo doesn't like the joke, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's totally true. By the way, teachers, there's so many teachers now doing comedy. Um, do you know Liz Blanc? Uh, no. She, she is hilarious. And, you know, she's a teacher. And now they even have a teacher's tour, a tour of teachers going yes. around doing comedy. They do. And it's very popular, too. Well, they're perfect for it because they board stand teachers. up and people Is that what you're talking day. about? Board, board teachers? Isn't that what it's called? Sorry? Board teachers? Board, board teachers? Teacher. Oh, I don't know. But that would be funny if it yeah, was. That's a good one. That's a good one. All right. Here are some things worse than death. <laughs> My marriage to Frank, my divorce from Frank, Frank, yeah, um, Frank, uh, I learned about my divorce uh, when Frank emailed me from the other room, but uh, all during the shit show, my best friend was there. She was making me laugh, making me pasta, making love to my husband. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's my, yeah, that's my, thank you, it was my BFF. Fuck her. Oh my God. Bitch fucking Frank. Oh. <laughs> oh. This uh, woman, um, I'll call her Patty. That's with an I. <laughs> <laughs> Calla is 1310 North Demonical Place, Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yay. <laughs> I didn't know that that was going to be that clip. How, how is it when you go that personal, like on things and, and how is it like in your life? Like, does it cause problems or is it? Okay. Here's something yeah. interesting. I went to New York Yeah. and people who knew Patty and Frank came to a show and I did that bit. Yeah, and, there's, and they're they're still friends with Patty, oh, God. but yeah, tell me. Um, said, uh, okay, so that Frank is not my husband's real name, right? Nor sure was he, nor was he. I just picked it because it was a dumb name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And I'm not even. We're friends. Yeah, my husband and I are friends. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I could only get to the point of telling that with with being, ha you know, having fun with it when, you know, I was just like, well, well I'm, isn't this I something that we have to do as comedians? We have to, like, sometimes go into yeah. the, to the darkest areas of our experience. And that's but sometimes you know, the challenge. And that's the thing about you, Ginny, is you're you're kind of fearless. Uh, well, <laughs> you might not think you are, but like in, in comparison to other people, it seems like you're fearless. I think you might even be signing up for to be a member of NASA. Yes, except um, I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> that will really put a damper on things. I don't know. Is it height when you're actually in space or is there no there's no height? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, not my not my thing. You know, but you know, the other thing that yeah. you have to watch out about when you're personal is yeah. like Jimmy, uh, you know, was telling me that he, or somebody was telling me Jimmy or Barry yeah. said, you know, oh, you sound like a victim. You sound like a victim. You know, you're whining about your divorce. And so, you, you know, you got to figure out a way like the audience doesn't feel sorry for you or yeah. the, they don't go, oh, there's a, you know, bitter woman. Like you want them to laugh. Well, is you. that is that a problem? I mean, you know how the, they kind of. People talk about Karens and there's like this whole thing about people, you know, or uh, Pam Palmieri talks about it in her act, too. Um, is there a danger? Do you, do you think being a woman makes it more difficult to do something like a rant or get upset about something? Is it more difficult? Uh, probably, you know, and I suppose it d depends where you're doing it in the audience. Yeah. Um, I would say, yeah, probably. Um but you know what? It's funny. I have a very dear friend, my friend Richard, and he yeah. loves comedy. He knows more about it than me. And he said to me one day, he goes, why are women suddenly so mean to men on stage? And I said, because women were the blunt you know, yes. uh, jokes. He was like, women smell, women this and that. 
And I said, you'd have to sit there in the audience while they just told you how gross you were. And I think a lot of um, female comedians have turned that around. So I, I think that's what's happening. Yeah, that's what, that's probably what's happening. And sometimes, you know, screw them, right? For, for giving you a hard time. So, okay, listen to this. There's jokes in the chat room. Um, first of all, Rex said, no height. There's no height in space. And then Matt Wright said, are there people who are afraid of widths? And then Kamala said, I sure am. I'm getting wider every day and it gives me nightmares. <laughs> oh, quit being funnier than me. <laughs> oh my God, it says Ben Rosenfeld under your, your thing. This happens sometimes when Boney is really not paying attention. I wish I was Ben Rosenfeld. Ben Rosenfeld, he, he, you know him too, right? Yeah, but from he, he, he's on the various thing too. And he is the best joke writer. He, just, he really <laughs> is. I mean, I was surprised. You know Ben Rosenfeld as well? How did yeah, you know because, him? Because of um, Zoom. Yeah. Because he and I were on Barry's uh, thing. Oh. Barry has a... And um, he's given me some punchlines. Uh, he's just very good. He's great. Yeah, he really is. He's really something. Um, but that's one of the other cool things about the Zoom and the pandemic and all that stuff that happened is like it brought all these people together that maybe never would have talked to one another or no, known about oh, one another. Absolutely. There's absolutely, in my mind, there's no way I would be getting the stage time I have now if I hadn't been on Zoom. Because yeah. I never would have gotten the opportunities to do that many shows, you know, that I did. How do you birthday. feel about social networking and putting your comedy on social networking? Because I've noticed that you've gotten really good at it. And uh, Oh, gosh, no, no. Because <laughs> well, you were you. sort of computer challenged for a long time. And now, I mean, some of the stuff that you're putting out there is really high level stuff. I really uh, I it. still am computer challenged. I've been trying to put up a press clip on my website and I like like yesterday the whole day was how do i do this um i don't know I, what i wish i could do more of is the things that seem people seem to enjoy is when you're just talking to the camera mm -hmm. you know when you just do like a TikTok video where you're just talking and you know i don't think i, I could be wrong unless you're famous i don't think your stand-up necessarily gets a lot of clicks but i'm learning somebody was saying that a lot of times they see funny people or funny things on the internet um, but they don't know who the person is, so they don't really tie it to that. And that's one of the hmm. problems with, because, you know, we just flip by these TikToks yeah. or, you know, these vertical videos, and we just see, you know. But Rex says, what are you doing tomorrow, Ginny? Something oh, he I'm wants me to talk about, my brother, this is not what he wants me to talk about, but my brother <laughs> is connected with uh, this organization called the LA Tribune. And actually, oh, yeah. he just got a presidential medal. Mm -hmm. uh for uh to honor his volunteer service congratulations yeah. but yeah. um tomorrow uh they're having a women uh for for women's um history month they're having a uh, women speak and i'm going to be on the I, I i gave him camel's name i was like you should have this person on <laughs> but i hope they get in touch with her but um anyway it's on tomorrow at the la tribune youtube site oh, or fantastic. facebook fantastic Okay, um, we're gonna have to end the show because we're at the end. This is wonderful. This has been super By the way, fun. Phil, yeah. I love you and Kamala. I love lunch therapy. I love everybody who's in the chat. I mean, it just, this is a really wonderful thing. It's like the okay. Zoom thing I was talking about in COVID. Yeah. It's just a great community. Yeah, and I really appreciate you being a part of it. I gotta say, you know, and also Very for happy. you, I'm so glad that you joined the comedy world because it's just a better place with you in it. Oh God, thank you so much, Joel. I really appreciate you. All right, so, okay, let's do this thing. Howard Ronan, thank you very much. We're gonna um, dance it out now. There's gonna be some, a really good one. This is, uh, this is actually just a video that I took when Camel and I were downtown. This is a low rider. And of course, the song that we're gonna play Ooh, that's relates to this. Isn't that beautiful? Cool. All right, let's do this thing. Dance break time. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, everybody, for being in the chat room. Uh, let's dance this thing out. This is the HSCC band in Australia.
everybody. We'll see you next week for more lunch therapy. 